it was they can actually find. And we are live. Hello, Dr. Katie Munro. You are the author of Manage Your Migraine, serial podcaster on migraines as well. Um, now, how is it, because you're a GP, but why is it that you suddenly developed a special interest in migraine? Well, uh, I was a GP in the NHS, and once I turned 40, I started getting regular headaches. And it took me a little while to realise that they were actually migraine attacks. And that was the start of my journey. So I started off being interested in migraine from my personal point of view and, and finding how I could help. They were pretty bad through my perimenopause. So finding my way forward as to how I could help myself. And then I realised the National Migraine Centre, the charity that I now work for, was so, so helpful. And I realised that there was a, a, a huge amount of education to be done to empower people with migraine, but also to educate doctors, pharmacists, anybody else that's trying to help people with migraine, because they're generally they're a lack of training. Um, so that's become my kind of passion, obsession, some people might say, endlessly talk about migraine. And, and I'm very grateful for the invitation from people like yourself to share some understanding about it. Well, it's an important thing because really, I mean, if, until you, I mean, I didn't have migraines, I'm sorry. Oh. Sorry, somebody just tried to call me and I don't know where you've gone. Hang on one second. Oh, there you go. You're back again. Sorry, somebody just tried to call. Um, the they If you haven't had a migraine, and I didn't have them until actually I got to, to sort of just before I went through menopause and now I have them on the odd occasion. If you haven't had them before, you don't realise how debilitating they can actually be. So give us a, an idea of what some people go through when they have migraine. Um, I think what people mistakenly think is that migraine is just a bad headache. And so people who haven't had migraine attacks, uh, and I'll explain why I try and consistently talk about migraine attacks rather than migraines. Um, it, it is hard to describe it, and they have a misunderstanding about it. So during a migraine attack, there are four phases. So there might be a prodromal phase where people are feeling that they're either um, very fatigued or have a burst of energy or they're yawning or they feel particularly irritable. Um, then there's the aura phase that about 25% of people get where they get visual disturbances usually. Um, and that can last anything up to an hour. Then it goes away. And then it's called the headache phase very often, but I call it the impact phase because in that main phase of migraine attack, it's not just about headache. We ask about the most bothersome symptom. And sometimes people say, oh, I get very dizzy or I start throwing up or I feel very nauseous. I can't eat. I can't. I'm very light sensitive, sound sensitive. I have to stay very still in a dark room. And so many and those are just a, a taster of the symptoms that people can get. And then there's the post that phase can last from three hours to 72 hours. And then there's the postromal phase, which can last up to another two days where people are feeling groggy as if they've got a hangover, sometimes called the hangover phase. So if you put together those four phases, that can be one migraine attack lasting anything up to five days. Mm. So if you have a couple of those in a month, you're not going to be functioning too well. The what? impact of migraine and the brain fog, everything that goes with it, I think, is why it's such a majorly impactful condition to have and in terms of of well when you, when you mentioned impact i was looking at one study which said it was they believed it accounted for 157 million days of absenteeism in the u.s i mean that's an awful lot of missed work oh, yeah. but oh, how, yeah. how severe is the range can they be quite mild can they get it to be to that point where literally for five days you just don't move what's the what's yeah. the range like so the range i think that's also why sometimes people confuse it because sometimes uh, on the spectrum of impact, people may say, well, I've only ever had one in my life and it was a particularly stressful time and I got some zigzags and I had a headache and I went to bed for three days and I was fine. And right up to the other end of the spectrum where people are saying to us, I never have a day without some symptoms. I have pain all the time, brain fog all the time, I'm fatigued, I can't do anything, can't plan anything. And then, of course, there's everything in between. So I would say a lot of people fall into a group we call episodic migraine, which means that they're having fewer than 15 days in a month impacted by a headache and fewer than eight days are, are really severe migraines. But if you start to have high frequency 
migraine where you're having say 10 to 15 days a month and spilling over into more than 15 days in a month. We call that chronic migraine. So I think it's quite useful to understand how we classify migraine. And then of course there are different types. So some people have migraine with aura, some people have migraine without aura. Other people will have vestibular migraine where their predominantly bothersome symptom is dizziness. Um, and so some people even have migraine aura, but never get a headache. And then of course in children, uh, we, we hear them talking about recurrent episodes of abdominal pain. So they may have abdominal migraine, which is largely pain in the, in the abdomen rather than in the head. Um, so keeping alert for uh, the history is really the key thing. And family history gives us a strong clue that that's what we're dealing with because we know this is a genetic disorder. An interesting thing is, um, just before we get to causes and things like that, but a couple of weeks ago in, in, in one of my other lives, um, I write up health education stuff for, for GPs in Australia. And one of the, um, the things that I had to write up was an interview with a menopause expert. And he went through methodically saying, basically, in the beginning, the um, you know girls and boys are about equal. We hit puberty. Girls go ahead when it comes to migraines. Then when around periods, they seem to get an awful lot more of them. Then around menopause, they seem to get an awful lot more of them. But it's not re regarded necessarily as a cause of. So, so what's the interaction? So what are the causes of menopause and where do the hormones fit in? So the cause of migraine are, first of all, genetic. So the genes, we know there are at least 40 genes that contribute towards migraine uh, manifesting itself. Whether or not a person has migraine attacks depends on a thing called epigenetics, which basically means the influence of our internal environment, our behaviors, and our external environment. So there are things that we can do that make the genes not expressed. And so when we are going through life as, as women, we um, are finding the influence of hormones is one of the most important things. But the key word I use is change. So your brain is set by the genes to be always more sensitive to change. And of course, that's an obvious one with women having menstrually related migraine or in the perimenopause when we know the estrogen levels are fluctuating wildly. But change in other aspects is also really important to know about and to try and manage. So fluctuating blood sugar levels, uh, having regular sleep is really, really helpful and restful, restorative sleep. So quality of sleep is important too. Taking regular exercise we know that's generally so important we should be kind of prescribing it to everybody really um, and sometimes that's tricky for people with migraine because they may be very sensitive to the fluctuations of blood glucose that exercise can trigger so we have to give some advice around that as well and then other things like stress what what uh, grates with me is when people say oh, i was told it was just stress Durr. not just stress <laughs> But stress is a contributory factor in some people. And of course, stress is linked with increasing levels of stress hormones. And then when you stop being stressed, you relax and your hormone levels change again. So your cortisol levels dropping can also be a trigger. Um, we also, um, we had a, a little pre-chat the other day, Fiona, didn't we? And we talked about travel being a trigger for migraine attacks. So if you think about change and travel, What's going to change when you've booked your holiday? First of all, you're excited, change. Stress, packing, finishing up work, stress. Often getting up in the middle of the night to go and get that cheap flight, stress. <laughs> uh, broken sleep. You arrive at the airport. You may have bright lights and sounds all around. You may not be eating in your normal pattern. You get in a plane, which is different atmosphere, different pressure. You fly to somewhere in a different time zone. And lo and behold, people keel over for a day or two with a migraine attack. And it's because of the combination of stress and other changes. So it's never just one thing. It's really worth looking broadly at everything that you can control and have a good routine. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. yes. So it, it's holidays that, that trigger mine, that <laughs> packing everything into the last couple of days before you go, just to make sure you've got everything ticked off. Um, and then, of course, getting on the train to go to the airport and looking at your phone at some ungodly hour in the morning and finding the BA's actually cancelled your flight. That was a fun yes, one. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, other causes, things like blood, you know, in, when, when we're looking at the sort of, you know, the, the, the way we structure the treatments for, for, for um, migraine, they're often around blood supply and I think one of the other sort of more newer theories was excitable regions of the brain. So what do we know about those sorts of things? Yeah, so we know that the processes that are going on in the brain are triggered by certain neurochemicals uh, and the stresses and changes are activating uh, electrical changes in the cells across the brain. So um, we call it a cortical spreading depression, uh, which means that electrically the brain is changing in certain areas and those areas uh, as that electrical charge moves over the surface of the brain that's what uh, localizes those symptoms so some people will get that happening around the visual area and those other people tend to get more of the aura symptoms other people may get it more in their uh, cognitive areas where they're trying you know thinking and processing and problem solving other people may find and this is a rarer type of migraine uh, that they actually start to not be able to move their right arm or their leg or their left arm or leg uh, and that's because you would think you'd be having a stroke or something Absolutely. And that's uh, a, a thing called hemiplegic migraine. Um, sometimes people think they have hemiplegic migraine, but actually they have more of a feeling of heaviness. And that's quite common with migraine. So hemiplegic migraine actually paralyzes people temporarily. And then when the migraine attack settles down, they can be fully, they're fully functional. But a lot of those people certainly do end up having stroke investigations, quite rightly, especially if it's their first attack. Mm, that'd be scary as scary as hell to put it for for one way. Because if yeah, if you didn't have a clue of what was going on, you really would think you were in trouble. Um, when it comes to menopause, then there are some people who say, "Well, let's, let's deal with the stroke with aura for a start." I mean, stroke with migraine with aura, not stroke with aura, migraine with aura. Um, what does a migraine with aura look like? So people actually know what they're what they what it is that they're expecting, and why is it that some people are told that they can't have HRT if they have migraine with aura? Is that correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. Uh, that's a short answer. So migraine with aura um, is one of the um, less common types. So most people don't have aura, uh, but 25% of people do. It tends to start with a um, central change in the vision. And that might be zigzag. Sometimes people draw the zigzag out and they draw it starting in the middle and spreading out to the periphery of their visual fields. Sometimes it can be blurred vision uh, and people will say, oh, I just couldn't read anymore because I couldn't see the page. Uh, sometimes it'll be just sparkly lights going everywhere. I had a gentleman who just had migraine with Dora and he said, oh, it's just like a kaleidoscope. So it might be colored, might be black and white. Majority of aura is visual. Some people have sensory auras in different uh, senses so uh, there is a thing um, where people get aura smells so some people smell cigarette smoke or burning or diesel and they they're kind of where's that cigarette smoke and it's actually their brain having a, a sensory aura of smell right. uh, and auditory auras as well can occur so aura does mean that if you are taking the oral contraceptive pill containing estrogen, you have a slightly increased risk of stroke. So we know that migraine with aura gives a slightly increased risk of stroke. And if you take a contraceptive pill containing estrogen as well, then that boosts up your risk of stroke. However, when we're talking about HRT, we're replacing natural estrogen. We're not raising the level of it. And so our recommendation and the recommendation of the British Menopause Society is to use the safest form of estrogen, the transdermal estrogen. So that means by sticking on a patch or a spray or a gel and using that type of estrogen, uh, then we don't we aren't concerned about the risk. So people who have migraine with aura can use HRT and, uh, and should get good advice from somebody who is a menopause trained and preferably a migraine trained specialist. And we yeah. have a lot of those at the National Migraine Centre. Like, well, this was about to say you'd be like unicorns, or as my mother would have said, hen's teeth. Very hard to <laughs> um, So we're not necessarily worried then about the HRT increasing the, the number of migraine that you'll have. We're more worried perhaps about stroke if you're taking an oral form. So the question then arises is, why is it that some people who are on HRT or they start HRT say that their migraines, if they've got massively better, disappeared and are fine, or they've got more? They seem to go one of two ways. What's happening there? 
Okay, so that it's a really interesting question, actually, and I think it, it's a real illustration of how individual migraine is. I'm always saying to people, we need to work on finding the right recipe for your migraine because I can't say everybody do this and you'll get better. You have to find the right solution. So some women, it's the fluctuating estrogen levels which are causing the problem. So if you raise the estrogen levels by using HRT, smooth out those fluctuations, they're happy, happy. They feel better generally. Stop. They may be sleeping better. They may be not having those night sweats. Their mood improves, all the benefits there. HRT can bring to some women and their migraine attacks recede and, and disappear. If you are somebody who's sensitive to progestogen, that can be tricky. And so some people say, oh, I took the progestogen part of the HRT and that didn't suit me and that gave me headaches. But they're rare, much, much rarer, I would say. And people who have migraine with aura tend to be more sensitive to rising levels of estrogen, where people who have migraine without aura are more sensitive to falling levels. So if you think about it, if you start using estrogen and your levels increase rapidly, you may find that initially your aura kicks off a bit. So the answer is, first of all, think about the word change. Only do things slowly and gently. Start on a low dose. Allow your body time to settle. Wait and see what happens. Don't panic, because we often find over that first uh, two to three months, things will settle down as the body reaches a steady state. And it's that steady state which is the important thing, I think. Also to make sure that people are absorbing it properly. You know, sometimes uh, people can stick on a patch, but it doesn't absorb as well as a gel or a spray. Yeah. The, um, so if you were still having periods then and you noticed that your migraines were sort of worse at the beginning when your estrogen levels were higher or worse at the end when your progesterone levels were higher, would you be, you, it sort of gives you an idea then of where you're going, really? Yes, I think so. And there are ways of manipulating the hormones, uh, even in people who are having menstrually related migraines. So um, bearing in mind what I was saying about migraine with aura, we sometimes use the progesterone-only pill, the uh, desigestrel pills, and use them all the time for women who have migraine with aura. And that can, in some people, really help to smooth out fluctuations and reduce migraine attacks. Um, in other women who are maybe using the, the contraceptive pill, which contains estrogen, if they're doing that uh, slightly old-fashioned now, three weeks on and one week off, um, they often find that they have uh, a, a a migraine attack in the period um, week. So mm. using those packets back to back and not having a break every three weeks is a, is a really handy way. But it's always worth to just talk that through with your own GP uh, and just make sure that that's right for you if you're going to uh, try something like that or your headache specialist um, will advise you. I'm, I'm saying headache specialist that could be your GP. So we have a lot of GPs who work with us who are headache specialists as well. And they go back into their practices and they spread the word about how to treat migraine uh, better. Uh, but it could be that you've been referred to a neurologist and neurologists may or may not be specially trained in migraine and headaches. Uh, some of them are extremely good at Parkinson's or epilepsy. So finding a headache specialist, either GP or consultant or you know a team at a hospital, I think is really helpful. Um, and one of the things I think people need to do is empower themselves before they go so that they understand what's going on, so they understand what the options might be and they know what to ask for. And that's partly why we do our Heads Up podcast and, and partly why I've written a chapter in my book about uh, you know what to do before you go and see your doctor. Because I think you do, the, the lack of training in migraine management is is dire really and we're doing our best at the national migraine center to change that i'm i'm popping up all over the place and giving talks on migraine and uh, we're, we're at the edinburgh festival for four days and then i'm doing a, an urgent care conference and uh, going up to scotland later in the year just keeping on talking about migraine i think we need to re raise the profile so more people understand how to manage it better yeah, it's interesting, especially when you say, you know, educating yourself. So, I mean, you know, when I do these, I, I have a little sort of look around at what everybody's saying. And if you look at the NHS site, you would actually think in the end that hormones are your enemy. Um, 
and that you know, it's really not something that, that that you would take into account. But from what you're saying, really, we do have to get the hormones managed before we start on the other types of treatments. Oh, definitely. It would be my priority in any woman that could be perimenopausal. I mean, obviously, it's around a whole conversation because that woman may feel anxious about starting hormones or not want to do it yet. I mean, we see a lot of women in their late 40s who may kind of feel that they want to wait until they're a, a little bit older and more obviously per perimenopausal. On the other side, we see people who are going through quite an early perimenopause, uh, maybe in their late 30s or early 40s. And I think it's just really about having those conversations. And um, there is some very good information out there. And um, we have our, an excellent website, but there's also the British Association for the Study of Headache. Uh, and they have done some guidelines for clinicians and for patients, which will be uh, available on the website. It's just being redone, so it should be fairly soon that that is available. And then, of course, the uh, Migraine Trust is a very useful website, has a help helpline as well. So there's a lot of sources of information out there. British Menopause Society has good information about migraine on it as well. Yeah, well, that's good to know. The um, A question came in that was basically you mentioned headaches there as well. There was a woman saying that I'm starting to get an awful lot of headaches. I'm perimenopausal. Is this a harbinger of, of, of what's to come for her or is it possibly no relationship between more headaches and migraine? Um, if she's getting increasing headaches in the perimenopause, it's almost certain that it is migraine. Um, some people have not realized that they're having migraine because they don't understand exactly what it is, but it can certainly start in the perimenopause. The good news is that in most people, as they get older, migraine tends to settle and become much less of an impact. Um, and I can speak personally and say, thank goodness, that's happened for me with some help along the way from various interventions. But um, the natural history is that it does tend to improve with age. But we do still have some patients in their 70s um, who are getting bothersome migraine. So I would say, you know, find out, find out, first of all, get a diagnosis, because if you don't get a diagnosis, then you don't know what you're looking into. And, and headache can be caused by many other things. So one of the questions I'm often asked is, what's the difference between migraine and a headache? And the answer is migraine is a genetic, neurological, whole body disorder of which headache is one of the symptoms. So migraine isn't a symptom, it's a neurological condition. So I don't like talking about migraines because I think it diminishes the impact of the knowledge of the disorder. So we don't talk about how's your asthmas or how are your epilepsies because we know that asthma is the disorder and people have asthma attacks. And I think we should be trying to encourage people to talk about migraine attacks because they are really so much more than just a headache. Yes, they are indeed. Shall we move on to the different types of treatments then, which um, seem to, to not include hormones in any way, shape or form? Um, <laughs> what should do? It should do. If you're if you're having migraine, um, where do we start? What are the what are the what are the common treatments that people would be advised to have? I break it down into three headings: lifestyle, acute treatments, and preventive treatments. So the lifestyle things are getting those things that I was talking about earlier: the routine right, um, making sure that you're doing healthy eating, low low. Uh, um, Low GI foods seem to be more beneficial, slow release energy, lots of protein and fat, making sure that you're eating regularly, having a bedtime snack can be helpful. Um, sleep, making sure that you're going to bed at the same time, waking at the same time, beware the lie-in because an extended sleep or broken sleep can be a trigger. Um, exercising regularly, staying hydrated, managing stress in whatever way suits you. I mean, that might be yoga, it might be mindfulness, it might just be having 15 minutes holiday from your family every day. <laughs> I think there are lots of things that we can do ourselves. Then there are supplements under that heading as well. So those, were, those can be taken on a, a daily basis. You need to take them for at least three months to really give them a good go and see if they're gonna help you. And in some people, they really do help. There's evidence for about five different ones. So headlines are magnesium, 
riboflavin or vitamin B2, uh, coenzyme Q10, omega-3 and vitamin D are the, are the ones that I flag up. The magnesium, you do need to be a little careful about the, the formulation because some are much more bioavailable than others and you need to take high dose. So if you take a high dose of one that like magnesium oxide, not very well absorbed, or magnesium citrate, which the studies were done on, it can be quite laxative. So just beware, find the one. I prefer the glycinate form or the malate form. And I advise people to take anything between four and 600 milligrams daily for at least three months. I have this little mantra. Um, uh, riboflavin or vitamin B2 is 400 milligrams daily. Uh, the coenzyme Q10 is the most expensive one. You will have to buy these and it is expensive. Um, and that's 300 milligrams daily. And then a high dose omega-3 and also optimizing your vitamin D. So if you think about vitamin D levels, we know vitamin D is made in the skin by sunshine and we live in the UK. <laughs> so we don't necessarily have all that much sunshine. And between the months of October and April, you can't make vitamin D even if it's a sunny day because the angle of the sun is too low at our latitude. So many people with migraine add, have the added risk factor of being sensitive to sunlight or sensitive to light in general. And so they stay in or they cover up and they can become quite low in vitamin D. And there's some studies that show that actually that can cause a problem with people moving from episodic to chronic migraine. So anything in the body that's out of kilter. And so it's also worth checking, you know, do you have a low iron? Is your thyroid function correct? All of those kind of things. Um, if you're worried that your migraine is worsening and then I move on to acute treatments. So if, if you are suffering from migraine attacks that are likely to wipe you out for at least three days and then partially functioning for the last prodromal phase, you need to find something that gets you back in the room quickly. And the, the key thing is to have three elements. The first is an anti-sickness tablet that moves the gut on. Because if you take painkillers and you have the gastric stasis, which we know is a part of migraine attacks, they're not going to be absorbed in your stomach because they're not getting through to the place where they're needed. And so they will be absorbed. The, the painkillers will be absorbed slowly. And we know the trick with migraine attacks is to really squash them fast so that they don't impact on your day. So an anti-nausea tablet, uh, uh, um, painkillers like uh, the simple painkillers you can buy over the counter like ibuprofen, paracetamol can be helpful, it tends to be quite weak for migraine pain, unless you combine it with an anti-nausea tablet, which makes it much more effective. Um, soluble aspirin can you, be wonderful. Do you have to worry about how many days in a month you're taking painkillers for? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so we, So the painkillers, there's a couple of warnings about that. First of all, I would say don't take your acute treatment on more than 10 days in the month. The, the painkillers and the triptans, which are the third thing in your armory. So there are seven different triptans. Often people have been given one. If they find that that particular one isn't effective for them, they need to go back and ask for a different one and try it. Um, not more than 10 days in a month for any of those things. But also never, 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 please take codeine because codeine and opioids can rapidly push the brain into a chronically irritable state and chronic migraine or medication overuse headache uh, can be the results of those. And that's the double street. And, and codeine is not very effective on the, pain, the pain receptors for migraine. It can be good for acute pain. So if you've had an operation, it's good. But if you take it on a regular basis, it actually seems to activate chronic pain pathways rather than switch them off. Uh, it's addictive. It makes nausea and vomiting worse. And sadly, it's still marketed in some over-the-counter medications saying suitable for migraine. And all the headache specialists I know would say, avoid, avoid, avoid. Um, the other new kid on the block for acute treatment uh, is a group of drugs called the G-Pants. And there is one who, which has been approved in Scotland for acute migraine called Medjapant. In this uh, part of the world, in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, it's approved as preventer. Um, but we can talk a bit more about those new treatments in a minute. So that's a, sum a very brief summary of acute treatments. And then preventative treatments come under 
three headings too. Uh, the first is medication, obviously. I'm sure most people who've had migraine attacks will have, um, will have heard of the preventative treatments and may have been worried about them because they come, a lot of the ones we have been using up to now come uh, from, other med from other conditions. And so they might have been used for blood pressure or, or epilepsy or depression. And they come with a lot of side effects. Not everybody gets those side effects, but when you read the list, it's a bit worrying. Um, but some of them can work beautifully in people with migraines. So you do need to kind of sadly try working through those tablet preventers um, if you want access to the more uh, the more effective, maybe more targeted treatments that are available now. Um, so tablets, medications, then injections and neuromodulation devices are the three headings of prevention. So injections could be Botox. Botox is a very effective treatment for migraine in some people. Really not in the places where most of us would want it. <laughs> well, it's here. It is here but it's also around here and back here. So you won't have wrinkly shoulders, but <laughs> we don't tend to put it in your, in your lower part of your face uh, because it's aiming to reduce the sensory inputs. It's not about the motor or movement muscles, which is what we are tra targeting with aesthetic Botox. Um, so Botox can be very helpful. You do have to have between 31 and 39 injections, 12 weeks apart, at least twice, to know if it's going to help you. The other injection uh, that we offer at the National Migraine Center is uh, greater occipital nerve blocks. And these can be very useful uh, to just really dampen down a, a, a bad um, episode of migraine or you know, if somebody's teetering on um, the brink of episodic to chronic migraine, it can sometimes help them reduce the trip turns or the uh, acute treatments. So that's a steroid and anesthetic injection on each side of the back of your head. And the other people we use these for people with uh, another majorly agonizing primary headache disorder, which is called cluster headache, which is a very different condition, often mistaken for migraine, but always strictly on one side of the head with eye watering and agonizing pain where people get very agitated and move around and, and great auxiliary nerve blocks can be very helpful for them. And then the, th the third lot of injections are the new, what we call the CGRP monoclonal antibody injections. And there are four available now in the UK. Three of them can be given by the patient to themselves and they inject themselves uh, once a month. Um, and these, we are hearing the words life-changing in clinic. Now we prescribe these through the National Migraine Centre. We do have to charge patients, unfortunately, because although we're a charity, we don't get any NHS funding. and we, So patients do have to pay for those. But you can get them on the NHS now, as long as you have tried at least three other tablet preventers. And as long as you're in an area where they've decided that migraine is important. And oh, OK. Sadly, in some areas, is migraine not important? <laughs> sadly, some places have not considered that migraine is important enough to spend money on. And so that's another reason why there's only about 21% of the health districts in the UK that have a headache specialist clinic. Um, so, yeah, there's a postcode lottery, unfortunately. The other injectable one is an intravenous uh, monoclonal antibody. And some centers are giving infusions of that every 12 weeks. Um, but, yeah, it, it's one of my great frustrations is that I can't say to people, well, ask your GP to refer you and you'll get these, these great new drugs because first of all, if they haven't used three other tablet preventers and not found them useful, um, then they won't be eligible. And if they go to a, a, a hospital who's, uh, where the funding hasn't been allocated to headache and migraine, then they may find that they have a real battle uh, to get them. And this should change, but you know, um, how, do we, how do we change this? This well, I think that we need a campaign, and you know, <laughs> we need a campaign. I mean, it's the ridiculousness of testosterone as well, and things like that. And in some places, you can you can't get X, Y, or Z HRT treatment because you know, if your government makes a national decision that a medication is suitable for its population, then I don't understand why 122 groups across the country, or however many there are, then make a decision that goes against that. I don't understand that. Well, it's, it all comes down to funding 
and an allocation of resources. And we know that the NHS is a is a scarcely resourced um, massive organisation uh, in desperate plight at the moment due to lack of funding, lack of staffing. You know, I think it's. Uh, uh, but I think adding in the lack of recognition of migraine as a condition that needs to be taken seriously. And, that, and uh, um, I was talking to a, a couple of neurology professors the other night about this, about why there is such a difficulty for people with migraine to access new treatments. And it's about stigma. Uh, oh, it's just a headache, which is why I am ferociously c popping up everywhere saying it's not just a headache. It is a neurological disorder. It's the most common, most impactful one, you know, in the um, in the World Health Organization survey a few years ago. It came up as in the top five. I think it came second in the most disabling conditions to have, second Ooh. to Alzheimer's. You know, so and when you think about the impact, it's not just impacting the person with migraine. It it impacts their family because. They go on holiday, they keel over, or they can't take their child to school because they've woken up with a migraine attack, or they can't do their job, they can't go into work. So they may, or they go into work, and many of us have, have worked through migraine attacks, and myself included, you know. And then you think, well, am I actually performing my best mm -hmm. if I'm struggling um, with any phase of the migraine attack? Yes. So that has an impact. You're going to lose your job and oh you know, we hear this years. and just from that stress of, of thinking oh my god if the brain fog weren't bad enough the loss of confidence and the fact now that i'm you know i've got a migraine for 10 days of every month um it's just it's an incredible and, it, and if you also add in the the changes of the perimenopause into the to the picture you know these these are a huge proportion of our patients are women in that sort of uh, reproductive, but also very productive economically. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe caring for children, maybe doing their jobs, maybe caring for elderly parents. And- Or all three. They are, or, exactly. And, and juggling all these commitments and having to deal with chronic migraine or acute migraine attacks, not well treated, um, is, is so impactful. So it can impact financially on the family, it can impact on careers, and it can also impact on the wider economy. I think the Work Foundation did a report in about 2018, and they found that it was costing the UK economy something like £9.3 billion per year, dealing with the with the way that migraine affects our society. So it needs us to take it seriously. We need it to be taken seriously by commissioners, by people who are, who've got the power to spend the money. Yeah, yeah, the silo approach to thing really just doesn't help because I would imagine that that amount, the, that the medications for it would probably cost less than that amount that it cost the economy. Yeah. 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 Also, with some of these new medications, you're taking a new medication, it transforms your life, it reduces the other medication, which you have to take. And you get back into your lives. I have people saying, I've got my life back. I can't believe it. I've had so many years of struggling with this. Um, it's it's a, a great time to be working in the field of migraine, apart because there are these lovely um, you know, new treatments which are seem to be incredibly safe, well tolerated, and not addictive, you know, lots of pluses. But it's also a frustrating time for the very same reason, because you know, we we can't give them to everybody that might need them. Yeah. Not everybody, not everybody needs those new treatments. You know, if you've got episodic migraine, you need a very good understanding of how to manage your own migraine, plus a very good advice on an acute rescue treatment. And often that will really change people's lives as well. Do we know what the long-term impact on brain health of, of migraine is? We don't think oh, that... Is that true? Yeah, I don't think there's any evidence that it gives you any uh, greater problems with cognitive decline or you're a higher risk of Alzheimer's or anything like that. Nothing like that. It, it's a condition which, as I was saying, tends to settle as you get into your 60s or 70s, tends to be much less impactful, though people do still get attacks sometimes. But they're often milder. <coughs> but no, it's not. So, you know, it's just really about the the impact on life 
when you're going through the phases of your life when it's coming thick and fast. Hmm. Well, that's good to know. Um, in terms of, here are actually a couple of, of sort of more pedestrian questions, I guess, and the ones that people would like to know about. Caffeine. Some people say, oh, okay. I don't have my coffee, I get migraines. Others say, oh, my God, if I go anywhere near caffeine or alcohol, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Um, what, what do we know about dietary influences like caffeine and, and other foods? Chocolate, that was one that was always held up as, oh, my God, yeah. that's a bad one. What do we know yeah. about I think um, that's a really good question. We get asked this a lot. and I, I like talking about caffeine. I think it's quite interesting. But it really illustrates um, the complexity of the condition. So some people uh, will give up caffeine altogether. Um, and they say to me, oh, it hasn't made any difference at all. Uh, so my advice about caffeine is be careful with it. It is the most commonly used um uh, psychoactive drug in the world so we all you know have come across it maybe tried it maybe use it too much so if you're drinking more than about 200 150 to 200 milligrams of caffeine a day it can contribute to caffeine overuse headache so first of all be careful of the amount find out how much you're taking and that will be difficult different depending if you're having an espresso or if you're having um instant coffee or if you're just having a decaf or you're drinking tea green tea red bull coca-cola all the caffeinated drinks just add up your total caffeine intake keep it into the morning if you're going to try it if you said to me i'm drinking six cups a day all through the day then i would say cut them down and change it <laughs> um, if you if you stop it quickly and say, right, I'll go to cold turkey, you'll probably get caffeine withdrawal headaches. But if you are careful with it, then we often find that there are some benefits of having caffeine um, as long as you're being careful with it on a daily basis. If you then get a migraine attack, you can take something with, take your painkillers with caffeine and first of all, it has a co-analgesic effect, which basically means that it boosts the pain-killing effect of, of those painkillers. But it also has an increased, improved gut motility effect. So some people have a drink of coffee and have to nip to the loo afterwards. So we know that that's variable, but it can be useful in a migraine when your gut is uh, affected by the slowing down of the gut motility from the migraine attack affecting the vagus nerve. So sometimes when I'm advising people about their acute remedies, I say to them the anti-nausea tablet, definitely, that if they can safely take soluble aspirin, <coughs> then we sometimes say, try dissolving it in a small can of Coca-Cola, just a small one, not a two litre, <laughs> just a little one. So that has three things that can benefit a migraine attack. First of all, it has fizz. So the soluble aspirin dissolves to a large surface area. So when it's pushed through to where it's rapidly absorbed, there's a large surface area to go in in your small intestine. Secondly, it has sugar. So if you've had a skipped meal or you your brain has become hungry, then it gives your brain a quick boost of energy and that can be helpful. And also the caffeine and Coca-Cola uh, can be a way of giving yourself a bit of extra punch from the uh, painkiller. And so a small mixer can of Coca-Cola and three soluble aspirin with your anti-nausea tablet and your tryptan is, is a quite good little pack to have with you. Um, but obviously, if you have gastric ulceration or allergic to aspirin or you have other reasons why you can't take it, like taking warfarin or something like that, check, check, check with your doctor. Um, because I, I don't want to be uh, giving people other problems. But <laughs> we've had a, a lot of people find it. And of course, other brands are available. It doesn't have to be Coca-Cola, but it needs to be those three ingredients. So sometimes people say, oh, I hate Coca-Cola. So, you know, well, have fizzy water, have something to eat and maybe have your cup of coffee then. And, yes. and you so may so that's probably the first time I've heard of Coca-Cola being prescribed for medicinal use. <laughs> exactly. Not a help. And I say to people, do not buy a two-liter bottle and keep it in the fridge and let your children drink it because it's not a health, <laughs> not a health food. Yeah. <laughs> um, other things that that people find um, may or may not necessarily trigger these things are they are there? Well, the, the chocolate as well is that one? Oh yes. Like so the <clears throat> so they used to. Excuse me. Hold on. Let me have a quick drink. I will recover my pen. <clears throat> <clears throat> so um, we uh, we used to hear people saying, oh, I've, I've been avoiding cheese, chocolate, citrus fruits, red wine. I, 
I've cleaned my diet up completely. Has it made a difference? No, not really. So in some people, I would say there are certain foods that seem to aggravate them. And if every single time you eat that food, you get an aura or a migraine attack really quickly afterwards, then obviously avoid that food. But it's not very common that that is true. So people will say, oh, sometimes I can have red wine and sometimes not. Sometimes I can have cheese and sometimes not. So in that case, it's probably more to do with other factors that were combining in the couple of days before that migraine attack started. But we do know, and somebody did a study on chocolate <clears throat> to try and dispel or prove whether it was a trigger. And they looked at um, the timing of eating the chocolate and they discovered that craving chocolate is a prodromal symptom of migraine, of a migraine attack coming. So people think, oh gosh, and it, it's, sometimes it's not just chocolate, it's carbohydrates. So, oh, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have something, I'm gonna eat a half a packet of biscuits or whatever. And then the migraine attack comes. And so in the past people have gone, oh, I ate the chocolate, then they got the migraine attack. But the chocolate craving, was a warning that you were about to get the migraine attack. So that's when to jump in. If you can jump in in your prodromal phase, spot the signs, take your acute medication early, at least the anti-nausea tablet and the painkiller early, then you may find that you don't go on to the headache or impact phase. The triptans are better used in that headache or impact phase. They don't work terribly well in the prodromal or aura phases. And again, that varies from person to person, but generally speaking, that's, we advise them then. And you mentioned irritability as well, which I hadn't sort of put together um, as being a, 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 a symptom of, of an impending migraine. Um, why is that? Is, that? is that the blood sugar levels again? Or what, what, what do we know about why? Why does it make us uh, <clears throat> I think mood changes are very common uh, with migraine. And we know that the brain is all joined up. It's a bag of chemicals. And um, so there isn't a separate bit called mood swings and a separate bit called migraine. So it's all uh, mixed up. And the, the same neurochemicals are affected if you're having anxiety, depression, migraine, irritability, it's all to do with the, the feel-good hormones, serotonin, dopamine, those kind of things. Now, we know that uh, mood changes and uh, mental health issues are much higher in people with migraine as well. So anxiety is nine times more common in people with migraine and depression very common as well. What is interesting to me sometimes is I hear people saying, well, during a migraine attack, I feel so desperately low. And then when the migraine goes, I don't want it to go. So they don't have ongoing depression, but the migraine attacks mimics severe depression in some people. And yeah. so I think it's it's really worth knowing about that link. And, and irritability and mood swings uh, can definitely be a, a warning sign. And sometimes it's the partner of the person who says, you're getting a migraine attack because you've been quite snappy today. So <laughs> if that's the case, listen to them, take your medication and, uh, you, uh, you know, allow them. The other thing that people sometimes say is, oh, I, I know when the weather's about to change because barometric pressure falling or thundery and light, uh, lightning weather uh, can aggravate some people. We don't fully understand why all of that is. And I think, you know, uh, another of my mantras is more research is needed. You know, the more we can find out why certain people have certain uh, types of migraine attacks and other people are affected quite differently and then the better we can maybe target some interventions yeah, um, not, yeah. mu not much we can do about the weather sadly <laughs> yeah. well, for people who find then that you know they get quite depressed during that period of time one of the on the list of the of medications were the um, tricyclic antidepressants would they be better off trying that type of medication it doesn't quite work like that, unfortunately. And that's one of the frustrating things is we don't have a test. We can't look at you and do a blood test or, you know, do a scan and say, oh, you'll be better suited with this medication rather than that one. So it's, sadly, it is really just being patient, trying one, trying a small dose, increasing it slowly, staying on the maximum tolerated dose for at least three months 
before you give up on it. So often we hear people saying, well, I took it for 10 days and it was, I didn't like it and it didn't work. Well, it's not going to work in 10 days. You need to keep going. You need to maybe increase the dose, obviously balanced with uh, side effects because a, a lot of these things have side effects. They often settle if you persist. That's why you need somebody who understands about treating migraine to advise you before you start these things. I think just dishing out a prescription and saying, I'll try that. You need a little bit more guidance um, on how to take it, how long. Uh, there's a lot of episodes in the podcast that can help people to understand uh, all the background of using medications effectively in the right way. The other thing with the triptans is I often hear people saying, oh, um, you know, I was told it was really, really strong. And so I should wait until it's really bad before I take it. And, and then if it doesn't get rid of my migraine attack, then I mustn't take another one. So that's all wrong. Um, it's much better to take it early with the constraints of counting the days, not the doses that you take. So taking a dose when it starts and a dose again in the first 24 hours, which you can do with all of those triptans, um, maybe what's needed and that's only one of your days. And um, I think understanding that there are different formulations as well. So triptans come in tablets, injections, and nasal sprays and melt on the mouth, melt on the tongue formulations. So find the formulation that suits you of the medication. Not all of them have all that range, but some of them do. And the nasal sprays can may be much more helpful if you need a really rapid onset um, whereas if there is one of one or two of the trips have a much longer half life, so they hang around for twelve to twenty four hours, so that if you're getting menstrually related migraine, you know it's going to calm day after day. You might do better with a longer acting one than take a short acting one that's going to run out after four <coughs> four to six hours. So you've really got to know yeah yourself yeah. What, what what where you are and how to manage that which would um, what your needs are yeah what your needs are for your migraine you know if you wake up every morning with a migraine attack you need to think right what can i take that will quick quickly enable me to get into my day but also just another little aside if you're waking every morning with a migraine attack you want to start so the check, check it check that it is migraine um, make sure that it's not a different type of headache disorder. So sometimes um, people get obstructive sleep apnea, and that's a condition where people snore through the night. They stop breathing. They they partially wake. They may not fully wake, and they often wake with morning headaches. Uh, so doing a questionnaire like the Stop Bang questionnaire can give you a screening tool as to whether or not that's a problem with you. Um, having a bedtime snack the night before. So I rather obsessionally say to people, so what time do you get up and when do you eat? What time do you have your lunch? What time? And that's very revealing, actually, because sometimes people say, well, I, can't, I really struggle to eat in the morning. So I have my dinner at six o'clock in the evening and then I don't really eat anything until about 10 or 11 the next morning. Well, your brain is really going to be struggling. So, you know, looking at the regularity of eating, I, I, I put out a word of caution for people doing um, the, the kind of popular now intermittent fasting. Yeah, because if you're a person who has episodic migraine, you get them once or twice a year, you'll probably be fine doing that. And there's a lot of evidence it's a good idea. But if you're somebody whose brain is really bumping along the threshold of getting a migraine attack all the time, putting in some prolonged fasting may just tip you over the edge and worsen your migraine attacks. And it's mm -hmm. the same with the keto diet. You need to just be careful um, with these uh, type of diets. And if it aggravates you, then go back onto uh, whatever you were doing before. Yeah. Neck stress and tension, does that have a, have a role? Oh, definitely, yeah. So uh, we know that neck and posture and, and shoulders are important. We know that strain and signals from the neck and shoulders can trigger and activate the trigeminocervical complex, which is one of the areas in the brain that triggers migraine attacks. But we also know that a migraine attack may give referred pain down into the neck and shoulders. So sometimes people have had an awful lot of 
in, you know, maybe investigations, maybe massage, maybe manipulations of their neck with also getting associated headaches. And actually, if we can sort out the migraine attacks, the neck and shoulders feel a lot better. Um, but if you've had actual problems with your neck and shoulders or if your posture is very head forward, so you're putting a lot of strain on those muscles, they're going to be tight. They're going to be short of oxygen. They are going to generate um, signals that may aggravate your migraine attacks. So it's a bi-directional relationship. Each can affect the other one. And I think it's worth looking at both uh, holistically. Some people find acupuncture helpful. Acupuncture can be helpful for migraine prevention. I didn't mention it before, uh, but there are uh, there's some good studies that show that people may benefit greatly from acupuncture. You need to find the right acupuncture practitioner. You need to have somebody preferably who's interested in treating headache and migraine. And you need to probably have at least one treatment a week for at least eight weeks before you can judge whether it's going to help you. Um, and, you know, like everything, nothing works for everybody, but everybody needs to know what the options are. I didn't yeah. mention um, the neuro, uh, I briefly very mentioned the neuromodulation devices. So these are, de there's one particular one available now called the Cephaly Dual, um, but there are others available worldwide uh, that are, are different. So these are devices that you put on your skin and they send in signals to help mute down those migraine attacks. So the cephaly dual goes, goes on your forehead uh, and Lloyd's Pharmacy do a similar TENS for migraine machine that works in a very similar way. Um, then there's a Relivian, which is one that goes around your whole head, which I'm not aware is available in the UK at the moment, but is in the US and other parts of the world. And then in, again in the US, there's the Nerivio, which you actually, you stick on your upper arm uh, and that sends signals through peripheral nerves. And, you know, so there are other ways of treating migraine than just another tablet. Yeah, it's amazing what that 10 stuff that, um, treatments can do, actually. There yeah. are some that they, they, I think some of them they're using for bladder issues and things. They're yeah. amazing things that they can yeah. do, which is interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, is there anything else that we haven't? I'm just having a look at the questions here. Is there anything else that we um, haven't covered? I don't really think so, actually. Oh, there was one question here, actually, that I haven't asked, and that is, is there a link between unresolved trauma and migraine? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I think that we are definitely aware that um, trauma, and particularly adverse childhood events, can lead a person's brain to be stressed at that time, and that can continue and show itself as chronic pain. Now, I'm not sure that, that there been many studies on on um, adverse childhood events and trauma and just migraine there have been studies on on chronic pain in fibromyalgia uh, those are other link conditions so we know there are some link conditions with migraine and i would say it, if you feel that you've got unresolved trauma then it's definitely worth getting some help for that and you may find that that does help uh, a colleague of mine is interested in the EFT, emotional freedom tapping technique, um, where you tap on various different places. And again, we, I don't think we know quite enough about it yet. <clears throat> but um, I, I think we have to have an open mind for any uh, techniques which are safe, which do no harm, uh, and which might be helpful to some people. So that might be mindfulness, it might be expressive writing. I'm quite a big fan of expressive writing where people um, sit down and just write for 20 minutes for, for four days in a row, uh, 20 minutes each day, pour out whatever's in your brain, write it down. And it can sometimes unlock um, painful issues and by dealing with them, that can help with pain. The pain perception, um, there are some programs coming through and some um, yeah, yeah, apps and things which which yeah. help which are about pain perception reprogramming, because some of pain is fear. Yeah. A lot of pain is generated by our anxiety that something bad is going to happen, and it's a learned response to things that have happened in the past. Yeah. So yeah. yes, yeah, definitely worth exploring those kind of things yeah. as well. Oh. Quick question over here from Alison just asking, teeth grinding, and I'm guessing that's related to stress and things like that, so that's probably a, another factor. Yes, it can be, and of course, teeth grinding gives tension in the muscles here and the muscles here, 
And so that can add in to the signals going into the brain. So, yes, by all means, check out your dentist um, and, and, you know, go and ask whether you think your teeth grinding. Some people have been prescribed these mouth guards. They're quite bulky, they're often a bit uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, looking at all of these aspects, I think is is worth doing. Brilliant. Um, we are coming up to time here. Where can people find you and where can they find your wonderful book, Manage Your Migraine? Managing Your Migraine is um, it's on Amazon and all the normal book sites, websites uh, and places you, um, anywhere you might buy a book is there. Uh, the podcast is available on our uh, nationalmigrainecentre.org.uk website, um, but it's also on Spotify, Apple, and where you would find any of your podcasts. So just type in Heads Up and you should find it. Um, I will be popping up at the Edinburgh Festival, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival on the 16th to the 19th of August. And I'm doing four uh, open, uh, question and answer informal chats about migraine um, with my colleague, <coughs> Dr. Yeah. David Kernick, who's part of the Extra Headache Clinic and uh, has been working in the field of headache for many, many years and doing a lot of research too. So um, by all means, come along. If you're an Edinburgh, we'd love to see people there. We're at the Royal Scots Club. Uh, two, two evenings, two five o'clock talks and two midday talks. We try to kind of give access for everybody. Um, the National Migraine Centre Charity, if you go on our website, it's very easy to become a patient. You can self-refer. <clears throat> and you just fill in our booking form and we will get the admin team will contact you at the moment we have a little bit of a waiting list because we had um a number of doctors who were working and our i think news about us has spread so much that we've had more and more patients referring so we've now recruited 10 new doctors and um, so we are really enlarged as a team and we do virtual consultations we ask either for a voluntary donation or people can prepay the full amount. Um, all the details about prices and costings are on our website. And uh, we don't need a referral letter from a GP. We, can, we just take the history. We do a full report after we've done the assessment and new patients have a, a 40 minutes to an hour consultation on video or on the phone. So some people are screen sensitive if they have migraine. So mm. that's how we... Help. COVID's actually been really good from that point of view because we had to go virtual, but it means that many people who are anywhere in the UK oh, can that's... access our service now. So it's much better for patients. I do miss seeing my colleagues over coffee, um, but uh, we oh. keep in touch all the time. Um, yeah. And it's, it, it's really expanded our reach. We see people from Northern Ireland, Scotland, Cornwall, yeah. Wales, you know, yeah. and all over England. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I shall leave it here now because um, somebody else has started a conference call next to me, which you may hear the competing voice going on there. So I will leave you there. Um, thank you very much. And um, I hope we'll speak again soon. Thank you very much, Fiona. Take care.